A wonderful and pleasant morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. What a wonderful, wonderful day. As we get our hearts and our minds in tune to sing songs of praise and of worship upon high. Let us Don't try to tell me that God is dead. He woke me up this morning. Don't try to tell me he's not alive. He lives within my heart. He opened up my blinded eyes and sent me on my way. So don't try to tell me that God is dead. I just talked to him today. It is all right, all right. It is all right, all right. As long as I have my Lord beside me, it is all right. It is all right. As long as I have his hands to hold, as long as he watches over my soul, as long as I'm under his control, it is all right. I am under the rock, the rock is higher than I. Jehovah guides me, I'm under the rock. Go tell my enemies, I'm under the rock. Jehovah guides me, I'm under the rock. Daniel's God. Surely will deliver. Daniel's God surely will deliver. Yes, he will. If you only look to him by faith, Daniel's God surely will deliver. If you know the Lord is keeping you, what are you going to worry about? If you know the Lord is keeping you, oh, why don't you sing and shout? Glory, hallelujah, praise his name. Every day is just the same. And if you know the Lord is keeping you, what are you going to worry about? Amen. Will we stand for the these next few choruses? I want to revive all in my soul. Down in my soul, I want to revive all in my soul. I must apply to the blood of Jesus to get a revival in my soul. I said, it is all right, all right. It is all right, all right. As long as I have my Lord beside me, it is all right. As long as I have his hand to hold, as long as he watches over my soul, as long as I'm under his control, it is all right. Amen. Have... <clears throat> Behold what manner of love the Father has given unto us. Behold what manner of love the Father has given unto us. That we can be called the children of God that we 
should be called the children of God. Amen. Everybody out to know. Everybody out to know. Everybody out to know. Who Jesus is, who Jesus is. He is the lily of the valley. He is the brightest morning star. He is the fairest of ten thousand. Everybody out to know one more time. Everybody out to know. Everybody out to know. Everybody out to know. Who Jesus is, who Jesus is. He is the lily of the valley. He is the brightest morning star. He is the fairest of ten thousand. Everybody out to know. Amen. You may be seated. Hear my cry, O Lord. Attend on to my prayer from the ends of the earth. Will I cry out to thee? Oh, and my Lord, lead to the rock that is higher than I. That is higher than I. For thou hast been a shelter for me and a strong tower. Amen. After this, our chorus will have our first prayer. Create in me a clean heart, O Lord, and renew a right spirit within me, within me. Create in me a clean heart, O Lord, and renew a right spirit within me. Pass me not away from your presence, O Lord, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me, O restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and renew thy Spirit within me. Amen.
we come still in mourning of our beloved brother, Brother Sherwood. He was an integral part of this congregation. We know that you said in, in Job that the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh. Blessed be the name of the Lord. You also say, in everything, give thanks. So we're here today giving thanks for your love and your tender mercies towards us. You humble ask our forgiveness of sin. You say, all have sinned and come short of the glory. And if we say we have not sinned, the truth is not in us. So we come knowing that you are the author and you are the finisher of our faith. We are black that everything that is said and done here today bring honor and glory to your name. Be with us through this day and forevermore. This is an mercy I ask in Jesus' name. Morning, brethren. So as we continue our worship, I just wanted to let you know what the theme for today's song worship would be, which is steadfast in faith. Amen? Steadfast in faith. I am a hard fighting soldier. On the battlefield, I am a hard fighting soldier. On the battlefield, I am a hard fighting soldier. On the battlefield, I keep bringing souls to Jesus by the service that I give. I got a helmet on my head and in my hand and sword and oh I've got a helmet on my head and in my hand a sword and shield. I got a helmet on my head in my arms a sword and shield. I keep on bringing souls to Jesus by the that I give. I've got to walk right and talk right and, and pray right on the battlefield. I've got to walk and talk and sing and pray on the battlefield. i got to walk and talk and on the battlefield, I keep on bringing souls to Jesus by the serve that I give. Said I was going to tell nobody, but couldn't keep it to myself. Couldn't keep it to myself. No, I said I wasn't going to tell nobody, but I. Oh, what the Lord has done for me, you ought to have been there. So, you ought to have been there. On the road, so I keep, and I keep, and I keep. And I keep shouting what the Lord has done for me. And one more time, said I wasn't going to tell nobody, but I, oh, no, I, no, no, I, said I wasn't going to tell nobody, but I, Keep it to my oh, what the Lord has done for me. You ought to have been there when he saved my soul. You ought to have been there when he wrote my So I keep and I keep talking and I keep and I keep shouting what the Lord 
has done for me. Closer than a brother, my Jesus sits to me. He's my dearest friend. He's everything I need. He is my rock, my shield and hiding place. Closer than a brother, Jesus is to me. Sing again, closer. Oh, yes, my Jesus is to me. He's my dearest friend. He's everything I need. He's my rock, my shield and hiding place. Closer than a brother, Jesus is to me. I'm going to sing, sing, sing. I'm going to shout, shout, shout. I'm going to sing, I'm going to shout. Praise the Lord, all that the great sorrow play wide. I'm gonna sing by Jesus' side. I'm gonna sing, I'm gonna shout. Praise the Lord, and one more time. I'm gonna sing, oh yes, then I'm gonna shout, shout, shout. I'm gonna sing, I'm gonna shout. Praise the Lord, for when the gates are open wide, I'm going to sit by Jesus' side. I'm going to sing, I'm going to shout, praise the Lord. Pass me not, O gentle Savior, hear my heart. Cry, while another star calling, do not pass me by. Let's sing it now. Savior. Oh, blessed Savior, my Lord. Hear my humble cry, while another star I'm calling. Do not pass me by, and one more time, pass me not, O oh gentle Savior. Hear my humble cry, while another star art calling. Do not pass me by. Let's sing it now, Savior, blessed Savior. My Lord, in my humble pride, while another star calling, do not pass me by. Amen. Are we feeling good? You may be seated. At this time, I want to sing from our slide a little song called, Thank You, Lord, for Your Blessings on Me. Amen? Thank you, Lord, for your blessings on me. While the world looks upon me as I struggle along, they say I have nothing, but they are so wrong. In my heart there's rejoicing, oh, I wish they could see. Thank you, Lord, for your blessings on me. There's a roof up above me and a fine place to sleep. 
There's food on my table and shoes on my feet. You gave me your love, Lord, and a fine family. Thank you, Lord, for your blessings on me. Although I'm not wealthy and these clothes, they're not new. I don't have much money, but Lord, I have you. And to me, that's all that matters, though the world may not see. Thank you, Lord, for your blessings on me. There's a roof up above me and a good place to sleep. There's food on my table, oh, and shoes on my feet. You gave me a love, Lord, and a fine family. Thank you, Lord, for your blessings on me. There's a room up above me and a good place to sleep. There's food on my Oh, Lord, and shoes on my feet. You gave me a love, Lord, and a fine family. Thank you, Lord, for your blessings on me. Amen. Amen. After this song, we will have our second prayer. By the grace of God, I am saved, yes. By the grace of God, I am saved. Glory, glory, Lord, hallelujah, by the grace of God, I am saved, oh, and I have been walking hand in hand with Jesus that's why I'm saved. I have been walking with Jesus. That's why I'm saved. Oh, yes. Glory, glory. Lord, hallelujah. By the grace of God, I am saved. Amen. Good morning, brethren and friends. Let us go to God in prayer. Most righteous Heavenly Father, we come before you once again, giving you thanks, dear God. Giving you thanks for allowing us yet another opportunity to come together as your people, dear Father, to sing and praise your name, dear Father, and worship you once again in spirit and in truth. Dear Father, we thank you, dear Father, for your word, dear Father, for your word is truth, dear God. We thank you for allowing your son, Jesus Christ, to be crucified and to through his crucifixion, dear Father, and his risen 
On the third day, dear Father, we have redemption, dear Father, in our faith, dear God. We thank you, dear Father, for, for our respective blessings, dear Father, which you have bestowed on us through the past week, dear God. We thank you for the men of the congregation and the women, dear Father, who has put together and prepared for your service today, dear God. We ask, dear Father, that as we worship you, dear Father, that what we do worship, what we do say, sing, praise your name, dear Father, be acceptable in thy sight, dear God. Dear Father, we ask that you bless the families at this time, dear Father, who are mourning their loss, dear God. We ask that you bless the shuttings who are affected by whatever ailment at this time, dear God, that you do touch them in a special way, dear Father, from the crown of their head to the sole of their feet, that they may be, they recover from whatever they are experiencing at this time, dear Father. But nevertheless, that they look up to you, hence come with their strength, dear God. Dear Father, as we are about to proceed with the worship service, dear Father, please bless the men that are appointed their respective roles, dear Father, that they do proceed and do carry out the roles according to your will, dear God. Dear Father, we ask that you bless our man servant who will be presenting the service today, dear Father, that you give him the necessary strength and boldness, dear Father, that what he has prepared, dear Father, will touch our hearts, dear Father, and that we will open up our mind and our hearts to the truth, dear God, and whatever means that we need to apply to our lives, dear Father, we do so before it's eternally too late, dear God. Dear Father, we ask that also as we do proceed in worship, that we focus on you, dear Father. We close our minds from all other distractions, dear God, and that the worship service will be indeed a blessing to all of us, dear God. We thank you, dear Father, for the one who has come forth singing such beautiful songs, dear Father. Continue to bless him and keep him and his family, dear Father. We ask that you bless our evangelists and bless the members, dear Father, who are visiting other congregations at this time, dear Father. Keep them safe. Bless them that when we are appointed next to, to be together in your house of faith, dear Father, that we will be allowed to, dear Father. We thank, thank you, dear Father, for allowing us this opportunity. We, we thank you in your son's name. We do pray. Amen. As you join me standing once again, I will sing, You Are My All in All. You are my strength when I am weak. You are the treasure that I see. You are my all in all. Seeking you as a precious truth. Lord, to give up, I'd be a fool. You are my all in all. Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name. Taking my sin, my cross, my shame, rising again, I bless your name. You are my all in all. When I fall down, you pick me up. When I am dry, you fill my cup. You are my all in all. Oh, Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name, Jesus, Lamb of God. Your 
Second verse. Taking my sin, my cross, my shame, rising again, I bless your name. You are my only Lord. When I fall down, you pick me up. Oh, when I'm in me, you fill my cup. You are my all in all. Jesus, precious Lamb of God, worthy your name. Jesus. Lamb of God, worthy is your name, Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name. She, oh, precious Lamb of God, worthy is your name. Amen. As we prepare our hearts and minds for the Holy Communion, we will sing. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true, with thanksgiving, I'll be a living sanctuary for you one more time lord prepare me to be a sanctuary pure and holy tried and true with thanksgiving, I'll be a living sanctuary for you. Amen. Morning, church. Indeed, let us be a sanctuary for Jesus. As we come to another aspect of our worship, the communion. And the question is asked, why Christians do communion? And I will use a few, a passage and a verse to explain all of that. But Jesus started the tradition of communion. He instructed his followers to use bread and wine to remember the sacrifice he was going to make when he died for us on that rugged cross. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 23 to 25. 1 Corinthians 23, sorry, 11, verse 23 to 25. And I will just read in brief. That same night in which the Lord was betrayed, took bread, and then he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as, of, as often as you as you drink of it in remembrance of me. It is about the body 
and blood of Jesus Christ. It's about listening to Jesus and doing what he says. He gave himself completely to give us a better life, a new start, a fresh relationship with God. He gave us physical food that we need to survive and spiritual nourishment we need to keep taking our next step with him. Let us go to God in prayer for the bread that represents his broken body. Lord Jesus, we bow before you in humility and ask you to examine our hearts today. Each time we take communion, Lord, we want to recommit our lives, our heart, our thoughts to you. Father, fill us today with your powerful spirit. Help us to hold this fresh remembrance and the story that never grows old close to our heart. As we are about to partake of this bread which represents your body that was broken for us, thank you that your death gave us life, abundant life now, and eternal life forever. Amen. Let us continue in prayer for the fruit of the vine, which represents shed blood. Father, as we take this cup, representing your blood, pour out on that splendid cross. Because of your blood shed for us, we can be free from sin. Father, thank you for your victory over death. And today we remember and celebrate the precious gift of life you gave to us through the blood that you spilled. In your precious name we pray. Amen.
A pleasant good morning to everyone. Romans 16, 16, the churches of Christ in full savannah salute you. Our next worship, next aspect of worship is called the giving. Giving is a worship by itself, just like the others. In Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, connects us to the mind and how it behaves. Let's read. I beseech you, brethren, sorry, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercy of God, that you present your body a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but by transform, but by transform by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what that is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So our giving hinges on this. It also hinges on John 4, 23, that we must do this in spirit and in truth. And if giving is a worship, it must be done according to the word. And if it's done according to the word, it has to do something with the mind. And if it does something, it has to do with the mind, which also connects the heart, means that that part of the body must be transformed. And in Revelation chapter 3, verse 16, the Bible says that it's either hot or cool, but God will screw us out of his mouth. No, that is a neutral position that God doesn't like. You're neither hot nor cool, but you're in a neutral position. If our giving is in the neutral position, not according to the word, it will not be a blessing. That's simple as how the Bible really um, states it. If you go deep into that. So it has to do with the mind, it has to do with the individual, it has to do with transformation and the whole of that. And the level now that we cause the problem now is grudgeful and all of that. So all of that must be out and put in the good part of it, which is love. And all of that hinges on our giving. And that will make a sweet smelling aroma unto God, which is acceptable. So that is as clear as what the Bible says we must do in our giving. Let it acceptable unto God. It has to do with preparation and the whole of that. Let us go to God in prayer for the giving. Son and Father, we come before you this morning, O oh God, with the thanksgiving with the, for blessing us with the ability to work with thy hands. Father, we come to you on the first day of the week, O oh God, to give you back what you have blessed us with. And with this, O oh God, it helps to furtherance the kingdom, furtherance the teaching, the gospel, the doctrine. Help us, O oh God, as we give as it come before you as a sweet smelling aroma. As you watch 
our hearts, O oh God. We ask of you forgiveness if it's not conformed to what you want us to be. Help us now as we say thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Your grace and mercy brought me through. I'm living this moment because of you. I want to thank you and praise you to your grace and mercy brought me through your grace and mercy brought me through I'm living this moment because of you I walk to thank you and pray you to your grace and mercy brought me through. Good morning, church. Today's scripture reading is taken from Matthew 25, verses 31 to 40. Matthew 25, verses 31 to 40. And he reads, When the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory, and before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats, and he shall set the sheep on his right hand and the goats on his left. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come ye, blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was unhungered, and ye gave me meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me in, naked, and ye clothed me. I was sick, and ye visited me. I was in prison, and ye came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee unhungered, and fed thee, or thirsty, and gave thee drink? When saw we thee a stranger, and took thee in, or naked, and clothed thee? Or when saw we thee sick, or prisoned? and came unto thee. And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily, I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of these, these my brethren, ye have done it unto me. Here endeth a portion of God's word, may we all say, Amen. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. All right, that sounds better. Uh, before our song leader takes his seat. Uh, you know, I've been... One of the things that I think I do is to know a lot of gospel songs. Because one of those days when I used to walk to church, I used to walk and sing gospel songs when I'm coming and sing it on the way back home so I get to know the words. But when... Chamber song leads. There are always some songs that I don't know. He's always come up with some new songs which I really enjoy that I really don't know the words of. And it's new. So I hope he knows this one. I'm going to ask him to sing the first 
Uh, we are one. We are one in this spirit. You know that one? All right, I said he doesn't know that one. So, uh, uh, Buck, you, you know that one? All right, you can just start it from the other back. That's the first verse. We are one in the spirit. We are one in the spirit. We are one in the Lord. We are one in the spirit. We are one. In the Lord and you. And hello, we are Christians by a love, by a love. Yes, hello, we are Christians by a love. Thank you, brother. You know, it's a privilege for me to be here. I haven't been here in a long while. It's a privilege to be here to share the Word of God with us. And uh, these days, I have to be wearing my glasses more and more to be able to see clearer. And that's telling me that the years are going by. But the text that was read this morning is something that we have heard many, many many times before. We have probably read the text over and over ourselves. However, this morning I want us to revisit it, and I want us to take a different look at this passage. I'm not bringing any new gospel. I'm not bringing something that is unscriptural, but I want for us to look at this scripture from a different point of view this morning. I want us to turn back to the passage that was read. And it reminds us when we hear this that we speak more about Christ and his coming. But I want us this morning just to think about it from a different point of view. The Bible says, when the sun, and they turn on the mic, my voice is going to go in a little bit. Can you put back some volume? I'll regulate it. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. And before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another. As a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come ye. Blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. It says, for I was hunger, and you gave me meat. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. Naked, you clothed me. I was sick, you visited me. I was in prison, and you came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we hunger and fed thee, or thirsty and gave you drink? When, saw, when we saw you as a stranger and took you in, or naked and closed you? Or when we saw you sick or in prison and we came unto thee? And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, inasmuch as you don't want to the least of my brethren, you have done it unto me. Amen. in the portion of God's words, may we all say, Amen. It states when. If you look at the passage and you're reading it, it says when. Now, I am not an English teacher. Uh, I don't do English very well, and that's why I do accounts. You add one plus one, it equals two every time. There's nothing that you have to figure out when to add a verb or when to remove this. It's just one plus one, and it equals two all the time. And that's what I do, but 
It says when, which signify that something is going to happen. It's when it's happening. It's not a possibility that it's going to happen. It's not a maybe that it's going to happen. But it's when it is going to happen. It's like I'm saying to you that when this happens, then this happens. Or when this comes, then this is going to happen. Or when is signifying that something is about to happen. And when that thing happens, and when we are speaking about God, then we know that when he said something is going to happen, guess what? It's going to happen. It's not an if, maybe, it's not a but, or it's not perhaps. That is going to happen. When God says that something is going to happen, then it will happen. You see, it might not be in our time or not be according to what we measure it because time to God is not as time is to us. Our time here on earth is limited, but God's time is from beginning to end, wherever that ends. And so when God says, if you look at Acts chapter 17, and verse 31, and I want you to turn there, and if you have a reader, we can just find it quickly for me. But when we talk about when, we're talking about something that is sure. You see, Acts chapter 17, because he has appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness. By that man who he had ordained, where he has given assurance unto all men, in that he has raised them from the dead. No, he has appointed a time in which he's going to what? Judge the earth. He's going to judge us. And brethren and friends, if we think that God raised Jesus Christ from the dead, then this thing we sure is going to what? Happen. Because no man has gone to the grave and come back up and walk this earth except Jesus Christ. And God said, I raised him from the dead. And if God is saying unto us that he can do that when he has appointed a time in which to judge us, then we can rest assured that time is coming. And so he says, when? When is coming? The Son of Man. The Son of Man, we know the story. We know who is called the Son of Man. I can spend the entire rest of today speaking about the Son of Man. Because there are so many things to share about the Son of Man. But we know the Son of Man in a nutshell. We know Mary the Virgin, who an angel visited with her and said, Listen, this is what is going to happen. And that when came to pass. So we know the Son of Man. We know who he's all about. And the Bible said, When he comes in what? And I wanted to find for me, uh, Chambers, let's go back to the text, verse 31. I want to find that for me. When he comes in all his glory, Think about it, brethren and friends. Think about it. When God sent forth his son, when he came the first time, we see him being born in a what? In a manger. We see God sending forth his son. He was born, in a, his life was threatened. He came as nobody into this world, but here, the Bible is telling us when he shall come in what? All is glory. You see, the second coming of Jesus Christ is one to be behold. You see, the first one might not be that triumphant, or we might think that, hey, oh God is going to come and in a manger and hide him to protect his life. But his second coming, when he comes again, is one to be behold. He's going to be coming in all his glory. And I want you can imagine what that is. If we're walking on the street, and the other day I was in Ligony. And I've been coming to jog around the reservoir from many, many, many years back. And I used to come and jog around the reservoir, and Michael Manley used to come and jog. He was prime minister. And he used to come and jog around the reservoir. He would drive up in whatever car the chauffeur comes with, and he parks along the side of the building right there. Sometimes he park along this road. And he comes out and he says to his bodyguards, you can stay here. It was not a request. He just said to them, you can stay here, and he went jogging by himself. 
And everybody jogs around the reservoir, he talks to them and he greets them. That who he was. But the other day I was in Lingani and our current Prime Minister drove up. Three vehicles come in and lock off the entire parking lot. And the guys came out of the BP and they go into the pharmacy and they walk up and down and then come back out and stand up and say, oh, you can go back in now. And then he comes out and he goes in and does his shopping, everything lock off, no other car comes, none goes. And I go like, seriously? But Bertin and friends, when the president was here, the same thing would happen to the president of the United States. Months before he came, there were guys who was in the area just scouting out and doing things. But when Jesus Christ is going to come, when he comes again, it won't be like that. He's going to come triumphantly. We will know that he's here and there's nothing we can do about it. There's nothing we can do about this. But his coming will be glory. Read that passage for me, brother. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and all... Whose the... glory is he coming in? His glory. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory. It's not my glory. Our glory is coming in his glory. We have to recognize when he comes, because his glory is what is going to come in. And we have no choice but to be there. Go ahead, my brother. And all the holy angels with him. All the holy angels with him. Then you know, oh, 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 if you think about it and you jump back to Old Testament when God sent one angel into the camp and the destruction that the one angel did is amazing. Just think about his coming with what? All his angels, the power and the force that is coming with Jesus. The first coming is a simple one. He come hiding in mangers and living like he's nobody, but his second coming, Virgin and friends, we're going to have to stop and take notice. Read on, brother. Then shall he sit upon the throne of his then glory. Then he shall sit upon the throne. I want you to find for me Daniel chapter 7 and verse number 9. You see, he's going to come with his holy angel. This man who our sins crucified, who they crucified. When he went before Pilate, Pilate said, I find no fault. And they say, away with him, crucify him. They whipped him and they beat him and they crucified him. And he was killed. He was buried. When he come again, brother, what is he going to do? Read Daniel chapter 7 for me and verse number 9. I beheld till the thrones were cast down. Yes. And the ancient of days did sit, whose garment was white as snow and the hair of his head like the pure wool. His throne was like the fiery flame and his wheels as burning fire. Verse number 10. A fiery stream issued and came forth from behind him, before him. Thousands, thousands ministered unto him, and 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. The judgment was set, and the books, the books were opened. Open. See, brethren and friends, whether or not we are prepared, whether or not we are ready, whether or not we want to be there, brethren and friends, when he comes the second time, he's going to demand our presence. We have no choice but to present ourselves before him. And brethren and friends, he's coming to sit on his throne. So whatever we think we have in this life, whatever we have obtained, uh, whatever we have as possession in this life, when he comes, he's going to sit on his throne, and we have to be present. We have to present ourselves before him. We have no choice, brethren and friends. This is his first coming. He came like nobody. He was in a manger. He lived among us and we recognize him not. We crucify him and he went. But brethren and friends, there is a second coming. The Bible says when. So it's not a matter of if, but or maybe when. When he comes, he will be sitting on his throne. And brother, what will be open? He says the books will be open. I'll get to that in a little. You see, he's going to sit on his throne. There's a purpose for him sitting on his throne. There's a purpose for him opening his book. You see, in today's days, many of us, we don't write in books anymore. But I remember the days when the ladies used to have the little black book. And they got down all the telephone numbers in them and all the little things they want to write. Some people have diaries, but they write every single thing that happened every day. But we have books that we refer to. 
Nowadays, we have our tablets and our computers, and so we try, but the books will be open, brethren and friends. What the books are going to do, it is recording what you and I are now doing in our lives. And so when it comes before us to judge us, the books will be open. But I want to ask the question, what does qualify Jesus Christ to judge us? Why is it fitting for Christ to judge us? John chapter 1 and verse number 14. You see, in John chapter 1, he came to us. He was God and he came to us in the flesh. He dwelled among men. He went through all the pains that you and I are feeling today. He was tempted just like you and I are being tempted today. But he never sinned. So he knows what we are faced with, Brother Richard. He knows everything that goes on. He knows us because he has been there and he has what? done that. So he now qualified to judge us. And we ought to take note. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse number 15. I want to find that God. He lived among us. He is with us and he lived with us. He experienced what you and I are experiencing after fasting for 40 days and 40 nights. The devil presented himself and he tested Jesus Christ just as he's testing you and I today. And even though we have not fasted 40 days and 40 nights, we are still being tested every single day. Read it for me, brother. Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15 and 16. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet yes, without, without sin. Stop one there. It says... We, but we have not an high priest which cannot be touched. We have an high priest that is touched with what we go through. You feel it because he was here, he endured it. So he knows what we are going through. He was tempted in all points, just as we are, but he says, yet without sin. Verse number 16, brother. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. But let us come boldly to the throne. You see, we have an high priest that knows what we are going through, knows what we are faced with. And so when he says in verse 31 that the Son of Man shall come in all his glory and he shall sit upon his throne and he's going to touch us, this man is qualified to do that because he has been there, done that, and he was successful over sin. And so we, as we stood before, as we stand rather before him, he will give an account of the things done in our body. Galatians chapter 4 and verse 4, four followed, we are his son and his daughter. Who is he better able to judge us than those of our parents? They know us. He knows everything about us. And not only does he know everything about us, he has been through what we are going through. So he's better able to judge us. He has been through it and he overcame. So who will he judge, brethren and friends? Who will he judge? Verse number 32 of the text for me, brother. Verse 32 says, And before him shall be gathered all nations. Before him shall be gathered all nations. Brethren and friends, whether or not we want to, as I said, I'm no English scholar. But the word all mean every. Excluding none, by none. So we can't have, we won't be able to present an excuse why we can't be there that day. Whether it's a morning, evening, and afternoon, it doesn't matter. We don't have an excuse that would be valid for us not to be at that appointment. That day is coming, he says, when? It's coming. And all nations will be gathered before him. And when all nations are gathered before him, the books will be opened and he will begin to judge us. Brethren and friends, we have no choice but to appear. We are no longer Jews nor Gentiles. We are no longer white or black or colored people. All are required to be in attendance. We have no choice. I have no choice. You have no choice. We have no choice but to be in attendance. Everybody from the beginning of time until the end of time will be in it. Those who have gone before us, those who are alive with us, we all 
will be in attendance when God sends his son and they come to judge us. He will sit upon the throne. Brethren and friends, why do we need to appear before that throne? We must give an account of the things done in our body. Romans chapter 14 and verse 12. It says, so then each of us will give an account of ourselves to God. It is not of ourselves to man. It is not of ourselves to each other or to a priest or a king. It is of ourselves to God. We have no choice but to give an account. Because it's going to record. And brethren and friends, remember, all that we are doing is recorded in that book. So we can't come on that day and decide to give a story. You know, we have some very good storytellers. I was watching a movie yesterday. Someone betrayed someone. And five years after, that's all the guy dreamed of, just getting revenge. And when he met up with him, he asked the guy, what happened? And the guy went on to explain a nice little story of what happened, why he did what he did. But when it happened, he was there and he saw everything. But the fellow didn't know that he saw everything. So when he's giving a nice story, you can see one is on the east and one is on the west. But brethren and friends, when he come before God, all our doings will be recorded or would have been recorded in that book. And there's nothing we can say that is contrary to what is recorded in that book because God is just. He's recording it just as he sees it. It's not, it's not according to his feelings. So when we appear before God, we're going to appear to give an account of what we have done in this life. Brethren and friends, you know, sometimes we have excuses, eh? Sometimes we have excuses why we don't do some things. But I want you to find for me Matthew chapter 13 and verse number 24. The brother CJ quoted a passage in Bible class this morning. You see, we have to live together on this earth. We have to live together on this earth. Read for me Matthew chapter 13 and verse 24. Another parable put ye forth unto them, saying, yeah. The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. Read on. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went uh -huh. his way. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst thou not sow good seed in thy field? From whence then hath it tares? He said unto them, An enemy hath done this. The servants said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? Read that again for me. What the servant said? Will thou then that we go and gather them up? Stop there a second. You see? We clear the field. Ensure that the soil is ready for planting. And for those who are here who know about planting, you go out and you clean the field, you spray whatever you need to spray, you put whatever pesticide you need in that soil to get rid of the weed. And so they would go out and sow after, expecting to get a wonderful crop. But when they start springing up, brother, it's not just the wheat alone is coming up, but the tear is coming up along. I said, but wait, didn't we not get rid of this? And teacher says, yes, while we're sleeping, our enemy plant them. He said, should I go and remove them? He said, no. Why shouldn't he remove them, brother? Read on. Lest while he gather up the tears, he root up also the wheat with them. Ah. You see, we have to grow together. We have to coexist in this world together. There's no getting rid of. We have to live as we live in this world. Our influence should be converting the tear. Not chop them out and throw them in the fire. That's not for us. There's a time that is appointed for that. But our responsibility is to live amongst the tear. God has given us sufficient. He has been there for us. He has provided all our needs. He has given us sufficiently for us to live among the tears. And we ought to survive and live among the tears. When the time is right, he will remove them. Read on, brother. 
Let both grow together until the harvest. Yes. And in the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, gather ye together first the tears. Stop. Gather ye together first. Go and get rid of the tears. Do what with them, brother? Bind them in Bind bundles them to burn them. To burn them. Virgin and friends, we are going in this world. We have to coexist with those who are not Christians. It's not our duty, it's not our responsibility to bind them and to burn them. That is for the king when he comes. But many times we want to take his job into our own hands. That's not our responsibility, virgin and friends. We are to live together. We are to coexist together. When the time of harvest comes, they will come and he will remove it. Turn back to the passage, brother. And read verse 32 for me. Verse 32. And before him shall he gather all nations, and he shall separate them one from another. From another. As a shepherd. You see, on that day, God, Jesus Christ, who is sitting on his throne, is going to be doing the separation. We don't need to worry about it. Our responsibility to do what? Go amongst the tears. Do what is required of us. On that day, he will separate. He says, all, all nations shall be gathered before him. And he shall separate them one from another. The shepherd divide the sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats he shall put on his left. Virgin and friends, as Christians, our responsibility start and stop with us living not us doing any separation. We have to live together on this earth. Let the wheat and the tear grow together. Note something here, brethren and friends. I want us to note. It is not said that he shall put the rich on the right hand and the poor on the left. I want you to get that point, brethren and friends. The rich will not be on the right and the poor on the left. The learned and the noble will not be on the right and the unlearned and despised on the left. But the separation will be the godly people on the right and the ungodly, the wicked, on the left. You see, there's no other separation, brethren. There's no other class. There's no other division. There's only godly and ungodly. And the godly will find rich and poor, and the ungodly you will find, brethren and friends, it's not about what we have in this life. It's not about who we are or what we have attained in this life. It is whether or not we are godly or we are not. And that's the separation, brethren and friends. That's the criteria is going to use to separate the sheep from the goats. And I want us to take note of that. So, brethren and friends, there is a criteria for the separation. Yes. He's going to put the godly on the right and the wicked on his left. All other division and subdivision will then be abolished. The great distinction of men into saints and sinners, sanctified and unsanctified. That's the distinction. Where will we find ourselves? Where will we find ourselves? You see, as you read on, brethren, I want to go back to the text for me. Verse 32, read verse 32 again for me and continue. And before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And which, shall... side will you be separ... which side will you be on when the separation takes place? Which side do you want to be on when the separation takes place? Virgin and friends, he's just telling you that he's going to separate. But what? Will you have to do to be on the good side? And what don't you have to do to be on the other side? Read on from my brother. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come ye blessed of my father, inherit the Repeat kingdom. Read that again from me. Read that one again from my brother. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Stop a second. 
Then shall the king say unto them on his right, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Come, inherit. Why is he, why are we going to be inheriting something that was prepared? Why is he saying unto them, come and inherit? Read the next verse for me, brother. For I was an hunger. I was an hunger. I was an hunger. And ye gave me and meat. you gave me meat. I was thirsty. I was thirsty and, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger. And you read it and friends, there's a qualification for him putting you on the right hand. It's not because he looked down and you know I was saying to the guys at the back this morning. A couple of years ago, when I bought the suit and I tried it on, I went into the store and I fit it and buttoned up the jacket and everything was comfortable. And now I have to wear the jacket open. Because some things is happening in front of me that I'm trying to get rid of that is just stubborn. So I can't, if I button it, I'm going to look like Urkel. There is some qualification, brethren, that we have to have in place. It's not because I am dressed where I'm going to be on the right hand or somebody's in shaggy clothes, he's going to be on the left. It's not because we are educated, he's going to put us on the right hand and the uneducated is going to go on the left. That's not the distinction, brethren and friends. Read on, brother. He said, I was a what? Start that verse again. I was, well, I was, I was an hunger. I was hungered. And you gave me meat. You gave me meat. I was thirsty. And yes. you gave me drink. Uh huh. I was a stranger. And you took me in. Naked. And he clothed me. I was sick. And you visited me. I was in prison. And he came on. Hold on me. a second, brother. Let's discuss just a few things from this point here. Those on his right. And he says, Come. You are blessed of my father. You see, this distinction is something that they have earned. It's not something that just come because of whatever. They have earned the right to be called blessed of my father. He says, inherit the kingdom that was prepared. Many times we speak about heaven is a prepared place for what? Prepared people. He has gone to prepare a place for us that where he is, we may be also. He's preparing that place for us to get there. We have to do what? Prepare ourselves. Remember the ten virgins? Five were wise and five were what? Otherwise. And they took enough lamp. They took their lamp with oils. But you see, sometimes I say to persons, you know, the other day I was watching monk. And Monk was going to stay overnight for one night at somebody's property. Something happened at his house and he had to go over. So he was packing his little suitcase to go. And brethren, uh, I, I saw a big suitcase one night. Big suitcase. And I said, man, for one night. And then when he closed up that one, I see him draw the second one. I said, no, no, no. So the person asked him what happened. He said, listen, in this suitcase are the things that I'm going to need. And they are backup in case this don't work. In the next suitcase, they are backup for the backup in case the backup doesn't work. What I'm saying to us, brethren and friends, is that we have to be prepared for that place. And preparation doesn't happen overnight. It's something that you plan for and you work towards. We are, we are going to get an exam tomorrow. We don't start study at the time of exam. We start long before we want to be what? Successful. We prepare ourselves so that we can apply. The same thing apply for heaven. We have to prepare ourselves here. And so he said, guess what? Ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom that was prepared for you from the foundation of the world. And I'm going to ask the question, why are they inheriting it? I want to share with us three points this morning of the why. Three points. They won't be long. I'll be through with them very quickly. They won't be long. Three quick points. The first one is self-denial. 
You see, the pastor speaks about when he was hungry, he fed. He was fed. When he was thirsty, he was given drink. self denial brethren and friends. In order to follow Jesus Christ, one has to deny himself. You see, it's not just saying, I want to follow Christ, and it, that's just it. I have to deny myself certain pleasures in order to follow Christ. I said it in Bible class this morning. Things I used to do, I will not do them no more places. I, things that I will love doing in order to follow Christ, if they contradict or they are against the will of God, I have to put them aside. I have to deny myself, brethren and friends. So these persons who are inheriting the kingdom of God, they are denying themselves. This is why they heard, come on my right. Denial, brethren and friends. I won't get into all the scripture, but when the disciples are called, they left and they went. One man said, I will follow you, but first let me go. Christ said, listen, you can stay when you go. If for you to follow me, you have to deny your mother, your father, your brother, your sister. I will have to come first in your life. For us to hear, go to my right, be blessed of my father, I must practice self-denial. Too many times, virgin and friends, you hear the thing is, this is who I am. Or some mistake. Virgin and friends, that, if it is contradictory to the will of God, it must go through the door in order for us to stand on the right hand of God. Otherwise, you will hear, depart from me. Self-denial is critical, brethren and friends. Without self-denial, there is no gaining what has been prepared. Second point, brethren and friends, is love for our brethren. Find for me this passage, Matthew 22 and verse 37 for me. You see, love for our brethren is not something that is spoken of and it's coming to be in Brother Richard. Love is an action word. It's something you demonstrate. For God so loved the world that he what? Sent. He gave his only begotten. God loved. Even while we were sinners, God gave unto us. You see, love is an action word. If I love you, I need to demonstrate my love towards you. So I can't just say to you, brother, you're hungry. I love you. Go in peace and your belly is full. That won't work. Love, read the passage from me, brother. Matthew 22. Matthew 22 and verse number 37. Okay. Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all, all thy, thy mind. mind. Just one second there, you see? Sometimes we love to be smart. And a lawyer was trying to be smart in this situation. Uh, and Brother Lemuel spoke about who's our neighbor a couple of weeks back. We know who our neighbor is. But we need to love them as we love ourselves. When I'm out with my friends, I will take care of them. I will take time out of my busy schedule to take care. I w they won't have to go suffering because I'm too busy. Because I love them. So, brethren and friends, we need self-denial. We need love for our brethren. Like faith without work is dead, so is love without action. It is dead. We can say, I love, I love.